Okay. So we were talking about the idea, let's say, with uh, Mordechai and Esther, that that Esther wore the garment of Malchut, the Tilbash Esther Malchut, that um, Esther wore kingship, meaning the attribute of divine kingship became something that she was able to wear as a garment. And what that means is basically, we're, the metaphor we used last week is if you're going into a different climate, you need a, a like um, a suit, whether you're going underwater, you're going into, into uh, where there's a, no atmosphere, you need to create some ability to transition into that different space and we were talking about that last week. And then we were talking about how that affects death in terms of that's the great transition. So we're really talking about, although we, we speak about the finality of death, it's actually seen in the Zohar as much more of a gradual process. Uh, like a lot of people think about dying as a gradual process today, like which, by the way, it's, it's becoming so schlepped out, dying, that I don't know if halacha can adequately handle the possibilities of, ex, of expanding our life to 200, 300. I don't know that we need to torture ourselves. I don't know. It's a good, I agree. It's a good questions that, that, that um, my goal is to, to train the, the students in our yeshiva to be able to answer these questions, uh, you know, in, in time, to be aware that there's down the pipeline, there are ready questions, but they're going to just get stronger and bigger, because uh, we'll be able to like just keep replacing parts. Like a, we'll, we'll have a printer that you could print the new liver from, and whether it's twenty years or fifty years, just you know, you'll have uh, artificial and rich people will have a, a, a full time doctor. It's, it'll be a computer program. The artificial intelligence will will figure out. Will be monitoring your body, and but boom, they'll click some buttons. Okay, so that's another question that relates to living when when you know you're on the decline, but you could keep schlepping it out because you keep replacing parts. Which which actually so but but the Zora, it's the the inverse of that is when you die, it's not like you're just dead. And there's no relationship anymore with it. not not only is there a soul after death, but the soul has some limited relationship with the body. So we're going to be exploring that today. Um, who, who are the ones who took that very literally are Egyptians because they mummified the body, the wealthy nobility would put their belongings so that they felt that they would be in the afterlife, they would need their possessions. So we don't actually believe that at all, but there's, we do believe something. We do believe that there's some relationship with the soul and the body even after death. And I mentioned last week, there's some opinions that say after 50 years, you don't have to say like, you know, a, a Kaddish on the yard side of somebody because they're too removed from their body. It's like, it's, it's, they're forgotten. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that type of thing today. So we're starting on uh, 118 volume nine of the Danny Mad edition, if you're following along in the regular Zohar, it's Chela Gimel, Volume 3, uh, Daf, Kuf Samach Tes, Ahmed Beis, page 169b, but in Danny Matt's edition, it's page 118. So let's, uh, let's take that away with a quote from Zacharia. Um, so to, go ahead, uh, you with me, Ben? Yeah. So too of Joshua. Yes. The high priest, it is written, take the filthy garments off him. And then it's written, they clothed him in garments. Elaine Alma. Zechariah 3, chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Garments of that world, meaning. I mean. The Zohar is taking this this uh, vision of, Zuh, of 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 Joshua the high priest, not to be confused with Joshua, 
the student of Moses and his successor. This is somebody entirely different uh, many, many years later. But in this vision, he's, he's told to take off his filthy garments. And, and what are those garments? His always interpretation of them is some part of yourself, not just your, not just your shirt, but your body and your association with the body, just that very association uh, leaves you with dirt. I, I mentioned last week, it seems that this Zohar is more similar to Christianity than, than most of us um, recognize. Actually, when I was rereading it and, and looking at it a little bit today, guess what I thought? I said, forget about Christianity. It's a little bit closer to the Vilna Gon than a chassid like me would, would uh, easily recognize. You're going to see in today's Zohar that there's a, a lot of the kind of, I don't want to say hatred for the physical world, but, but disdain for the, for, for the physical world that the Vilna Gon and his father, followers had. They didn't invent it. They, they, it was already there. And... Today's Zohar is going to be a, a primary example, not just in a vague way, but very specific about how they saw the function of the body versus the soul and the spirit. And, 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 and we're going to see specific examples of that that will influence or could be why the, the Vilna Gon interpreted certain Kabbalistic Lurianic ideas in that particular way, because it could be based on, on the Zohar that we're going to do today, uh, particularly with the concept of what Hasidim call elevating the sparks from the physical world, what that means for a Hasid is, is partake of the physical world. Of course, do it with discretion. Of course, do it according to halacha, but don't, don't deny yourself necessarily. Elevate it. That's why we see uh, elevating the, the sparks. Uh, the only one is quite the contrary, in the complete opposite way. He sees the idea of elevating the sparks as take out the sparks of the physical world because, because the physical world is the only good thing about the physical world is whatever little spark of holiness that's in it. As soon as you elevate the spiritual from the physical, the physical will be worthless totally and will be able to be like totally kind of like self-destruct and, and disappear and, and, or be totally within the realm of the klipa because you, you free the Kedusha so it's no longer in Galut. So he saw that same teaching. David Newton, you hear me? You get the, the drift? I do. With me. So it's like the same teaching that Hasidim used to embrace going out to a good restaurant and say, we're going to make a l'chaim, we're going to enjoy ourselves. I was just talking to somebody about yard site, and they were telling me, oh, we can't do this in a yard site. I'm like, yeah, you're right. In the Shulchan Aruch, it says you got to fast on a yard site. You should fast. But now Hasidim make a farbringen. They get drunk on a yard site. It's like the Benahapachu. It's the exact opposite of what, what was originally done. So I don't know who's right, who's wrong here, but the Vilna Gon versus the Baal Shem Tov, this, this idea of elevating the physical meant the exact opposite. For the Vilna Gon, elevating the spiritual from the physical meant the, just realizing that the spiritual needs to be rescued from the physical. And once the rescue takes place, it's like you take the captive from, from you, you get the hostage out of the hostage situation, and then what do you do? You shoot the, the hijackers, basically. You get rid of them. You, you, you kill them. So to the Vilna Gon, that's how he saw the physical world. You can't kill it because it, it, it's got us. Our souls are its ho our hostage. Once you free the hostage, get rid of it. We're going to see some hints to that, more than hints, actually, in today's hour. Okay. And can I ask a question? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it, it seems that, you know, and this comes up in a lot of material, Um so it, it does seem that there is at least, and I don't know if it can be connected with Litvak or Midnaged, or because it seems it goes way farther back. Uh, mm -hmm. Even Luria seems to be wanting somehow to shed 
the physical. So correct. Now there's the Mishnagdim didn't create this. They just held on to it longer than the Hasidim. And by the way, even the Hasidim, there's a lot of stories how within the Hasidic world there was a lot of tension around this. Yes, uh, David. David Newton. No, I just. I mean, all I'm just going back to. I just wanted to know how this fits in because all the other, all, you know, when you read a Torah commentary about this in the Haftorah, um, basically they refer to the dirty garments as the fact that Yehoshua, the high priest's son, sons had married out and the dirty garments represented their wives who were non-Jews. Shiv and Panim Latar, 70 interpretations. They're all good, you know, and, you know. We, we, there are some people who spend a lot of time trying to like take all the variety of interpretations and interconnect them. I have no problem with that. I sometimes do that, but it's not like I feel the need to like, let me figure out a way to put those two ter- interpretations and weave them into one story. And it can stand alone, alone, you know? So, you know, like the, the Zohar, the Zohar has that, that's the Zohar is giving its kind of Kabbalistic interpretation. But uh, getting back to Yassi, and then we'll just keep going, is, is yes, uh, the more people really analyze whether they're academics or even non-academics, uh, like me, I'm not an academic, but the more we analyze kind of like the origins of Hasidim and Misnagdim, uh-huh. they're not just origins in maybe who their particular teachers might have been or, or influences that were happening to them in the world right at that moment in time. You're talking about strands that were in Judaism from, you know, basically forever. <laughs> I don't want to say forever, but for a long time, for both the Hasidim and the Misnagdim. And interestingly enough, because a lot of people like to say, like, the Misnagdim were holding on to, the, to tradition, and the Hasidim were not. And some of the more contemporary scholarship of the Bill Lugon says, no, actually, he was probably equally creative and, and departing from tradition, maybe even more than the Hasidim. Like we, we, we make up all these kind of like stereotypes of like, here were the Misnagdim and they were just keeping the tradition. Comes the Hasidim, they wanted to break with tradition. And that's actually simply not true. They both broke with tradition and they both were holding on to tradition at the same time, you know? I mean, because times are changing. Like, so if we said like right now, if I were to say, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna encourage people to um, those who are not going to shul anyway to stay at home and hear the Megillah at home from a, on a phone or something like that, quit Zoom or something like that. I would not say that two years ago. I, I wouldn't say that. So you could argue and say, I'm breaking from tradition. The answer is um, I'm responding to a new reality called COVID. We didn't have COVID two years ago. Last year we were struggling with it. I was arguing, I already understood that it was okay to do um, to stay at home and, and, and hear, you know, the McGill at home for those who are good at that gathering. But it was a new idea and people didn't know how to respond to it. And they were, and they were just going by what they, what they were used to. Of course, if, if you have a, if it means nothing to you to go down the street and hear the McGill and, 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 and people aren't dying all around you because of it, you should go hear the McGill. You shouldn't just stay home. Again, what is that? Is that a change or not? You know, it, if, if we go back and learn the sources, I could argue with you and say it's not a change at all. The sources were already all there. Um, I, the, there's some, it's interesting because the, the, there's some people who say, wow, the Orthodox response to COVID is totally novel and totally creative and totally fascinating. Or some people say it didn't go far enough. But the point is, let's say you say it's novel and creative. It's actually that not that novel. It's just that it's taking a new situation and applying old principles. So is that new or is that old? It's both. That's the answer. So that could be said also about Hasidim and Misnagdim as well. Okay. Let's continue. L'chaim for Hasidim. L'chaim for Misnagdim. I have to prepare. I have a wine tasting tomorrow. Oh, you got to prepare. <laughs> I have to. I have to. <laughs> I'm required. Sounds enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. Look, not 
work doesn't have to torture you. It can, it sometimes it definitely does. But, you know, sometimes, look, it's like that, that might be the, the, the issue at hand about the body, you know. Okay. Right. Right. Well, you have to do 30 days before the holiday. You have to prepare. So I don't know if you're late for Tu Bishvat or early for Purim, but you're, no, you definitely need to prepare. Fruit and nut tasting, yeah. May hacha milin kadmon u hacha. The kol zimna de gufa de hayal makayma bekiver bekiyuma. Okay. Um, from here, previous words. From here, we learn that as long as the body of this world endures in the grave, the spirit is not clothed in the garment of this that world. As it is written, for, they took the filthy garments off him first, and <laughs> after they clothed them in garments. So, so basically, very simply put, as long as the body is in the grave, the attachment to the body gets in the way of the freedom and self-actualization of the soul. Again, I'm going to repeat that. When the body is dead, but still there, hasn't decomposed, that somehow gets in the way of the soul's full ascension into God and Aiden. It's a very powerful statement. What, why? And we're going to be exploring that. Why don't we start with note 195? Zev. 195. Um, the context, this is on, on so too of Joshua the high priest. The context in Zechariah reads, he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of Haviah, the Hasatan, the accuser, um, standing at his right to accuse him. Haviah said to the accuser, may Haviah rebuke you, O accuser, may Haviah who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed in filthy garments when he stood before the angel. The angel spoke up and said to his attendants, take the filthy garments off him. And he said to him, see, I have removed your guilt from you and you shall be clothed in robes. Then I gave the order, let a pure diadem be placed on his head. And they placed the pure diadem on his head and clothed him in garments as the angel of Haviah remained standing. The angel of Haviah solemnly advised Joshua saying, thus says Haviah of hosts, if you walk in my paths and keep my charge, then you will govern my house and guard my courts. And I will let you move about among these standing here. The conclusion apply, uh, implies that Joshua will be rendered fit to associate with heavenly beings. On this passage, see elsewhere in the Zohar. As understood by the spiritual messenger, Joshua the high priest is apparently already in the Garden of Eden. Joshua's filthy garments are his physical body decomposing in the grave, whereas his new garments are the ethereal body of that world, namely the world beyond. The phrase previous words or matters apparently refers to the discussion about closing the eyes of the departed. Once the vision of this world is removed, the soul can proceed to the vision of the world beyond. See above notes. On the need for the physical body to decompose before the spirit is clothed in an eth ethereal body, see Talmud Shabbos, where it says, for all 12 months after death, one's body endures and his soul ascends and descends. After 12 months, the body ceases to exist and the soul ascends and never again descends. See also Vayikra Great. Okay, we continue uh, the middle of 118 as the angel of Havaya. Umalach Hashem Omed, Mahu Omed. Remain standing, Zechariah 3, verse 5. El, what is meant by standing? El Dahi Atara, the Ikre Malach Hashem. Well, this is the crown called the Malach, the angel of God. The Kaima al Reshayon, the Tzadikayu, the Dahi Hu Omed. Who stands upon the head of the righteous. This is standing. Standing upon the head, above. After they have been clothed in this beautiful garment. Okay, note 196, Ev. As the angel of Havaya remains standing. The title of Angel of Havaya alludes to Shrina, who stands upon the head of the righteous. 
uh, see in Talmud Brachas where it says, in the world that is coming, the righteous sit uh, with their crowns on their heads, basking in the radiance of Shrina. See also in Megillah where it says, in the time to come, the blessed Holy One will be a crown upon the head of every single righteous person. On the Shrina as an angel, see above note 112. So is it is it from the Malach? I mean, I'm assuming that the is it the pasuk that ends with Umalach Hashem Omed, and it's saying it's kind of saying like, how do I know that Vayalvish that the begadim, the clothing that are replacing the dirty clothing, are kind of like special clothing, because the next phrase means that you have like this crown that's super special and the type of crown that's on type top of of a tzaddik says so it must be that these new clothing are like you know the Saks Fifth Avenue clothing you know the super fancy is that sort of what it's like the deductive interpretation here yeah yeah in other words only because or in the merit of or or once uh Yoshua gets rid of his earthly garment meaning his attachment to his body is his, his ascension Above the crown, which is the angel of the Shrina, that's of the Aravaya, that's above his head, represents that he he merits to have this this level manifesting on him. He wouldn't have access. He wouldn't have that. He wouldn't right. have the angel standing over his head like a crown. A crown is something that crowns you, so to speak. It's, it's it guides you directs you and inspires you you're not directed you're not inspired by that level of an angelic shina being before the new garments correct and, and, and the crown is separate and distinct and is not modifying the in other words that's not the garb no but that's it's, not the garb that's it's a separate thing it's uh yeah correct yeah okay Train Gufen Kachada. Two bodies cannot endure, together cannot endure. Lo Yachlan Lamekam. Kol Zimna de Haikayam, Rucha Lomakabla Achara. As long as this one ex exists, the spirit can't receive another, which is basically saying, you know, as long as the body is there, the soul is not, is going to have a problem. It's Avarda Achara Zamina Miyad. Oh, this is like very presidential. <laughs> there's there's no um, do regnums. There's only one regnum at a time. Yeah. So okay, on the simple reading, it would seem like, you know, you can't have two presidents. The, the reason why Trump, I don't care if you liked him. I, I understand there were certain <laughs> things to like. He was a disaster in terms of leaving. You got to leave. You know, when it's time to leave, you got to say, you know, a, a, two two angels, can't, uh, two kings can't wear the same crown. So there's an understanding, there's always been an understanding that after an election, one, whoever wins, the, 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 the lame duck president who's, who's just finishing the term starts acknowledging, you know, giving, and, and he's still the president, but he's giving over his blessing, he acknowledges his defeat, so to speak. So I'm not here to blast Trump. Even David Melech he... made sure that as he was, as his term was ending, he made it clear that he was giving the nod to Shlomo. Like you have to, even kings do it. Yeah, yeah. So you always have to do that. So the, the reason is, and there's always like the day, the, the last day, which is like a complicated day where where the, the past ruler has to step aside from his kingship to make room for the next king, which, by the way, could be how the Zohar understands death, uh, the process of dying. Why don't we just go from healthy living to death, to instant death, the way it used to be in the Medrash? And the answer is, it's a transitional period. Before you die, is a when, you're, when you're sick and dying, but not yet dead, that's a transitional period. And once you're dead, but not decomposed, that's also a, traditional, a, a transitional period. So the simple reading is you can't have two kings wearing one crown. You can't have two people in the same position. It doesn't work. It's like, it's like you, you, you tell two people to do the same thing. It's just, it, you, you, not only is it not helpful, 
And unless you delegate it in a way where one can tell the other what to do or they can divide what to do, it doesn't work. But here it doesn't mean that. It takes that concept and applies it to somehow the soul's inability to be free while the body is still in the grave before it decomposes. We, and we, it, that doesn't make any sense. Zohar is going to explain it. So he's going to explain that the body has a certain power. What's the power of the body? The power of the body is, and this is what Western medicine is struggling with. I went to a doctor today. Doctor is telling you things. I'm not a scientist. He's telling me, he's describing my body. It's not about me. It's about physiology. It's a, it's, it's a biological science, right? It's, 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 it's very technical. It applies to everyone. You, you could identify, a di diagnose and, and treat based on science. That's what works. What do we want? We want to hear about ourselves. It is about us. It's about our health. It's about our body. But there's a disconnect between the body and the soul. That's why everybody is looking for Chinese medicine and 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 Reiki and 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 Kabbalist, Kabbalist healing and you know you name it. They're looking for it because like it's so hard to go to a doctor and realize that you're not special. This is just science, right? So. The Zohar understands that also. The Zohar says, no, you, you, are, you are and you're not special. You're not special because the soul is what makes you special, not the body. That's not true. The body also makes you special. We have the Chiyas Mesim. We have the Mitzvahs of the body. Well, not in this Zohar. This Zohar seems to forget all that. This is a Vilna Gon Zohar. Down, down. Is your, yes, when you're in the body and you're healthy and you're able to do a Mitzvah, you better do the Mitzvah. Otherwise, you're going to end up doing an Avera and your body's going to take down your soul. But the whole reason why you do the mitzvahs is so that when you die, your body, you can get rid of it. It's a burden and you want to get rid of it. And what do you want it to happen to it? It should decompose and turn into dirt. That's what you want. Because even when it's whole or not totally decomposed, it attracts the soul. The soul isn't free anymore. Crazy stuff. It is, in a way, sort of like cutting off your nose to spite your face continuously. You're like empowering your body by doing the mitzvos, where really you should be empowering yourself by decomposing your body from the get-go so that it would be easy for the soul to leave more quickly. So there, yeah, well, but okay, so, so. no, that, that wouldn't be quite right. I mean, exactly. You know, no, I, I know. <laughs> Go ahead, no, no. But I mean, there are people that actually do believe something like that. Like if there is an afterlife, an afterlife is hypothetically without these impediments, then we should get rid get of there it more quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but the thing is, then we can't do any mitzvot. You can't do mitzvot in the next world. This is the only place that we can do mitzvot. So if you took this to its illogical conclusion, it would be something like Ben. We don't take it. It's it's offset by counter Come here. Come here. But there is something that's not as extreme as what Ben was suggesting that we should try to just, you know, be die as, as quickly as possible to finish this world. There is something where, I, I, I don't know where it is, it might be the Zohar that says, it always bothered me, but it makes sense in this context, which means the weakness of the body is the strength of the soul. Meaning, since the body's inherent drive is its own pleasure, its own interest, its own narcissism, it is in opposition. It's Zelu Umasa. We talked about last time the Yetzahara being in, in, in a position of opposing the Yetzatov, right? So <laughs> if it's somehow, what do we say about Asav? When this one's on top, the other one's on bottom. They're in a struggle. You can't have two, 
you can't both win the gold medal. One wins, one loses, right? Um, Zelu said that's the very nature of it. So, so the Zohar says this idea of the strength of the body is the weakness of the soul, even in life. This is in death. Okay, let's let's read. Um, the Blessed Holy One does not want both of them enduring together. Let's read, no, I don't know if we, did we read till note 197? Yeah, just like the impulse of the evil and impulse of this world, in this world, the Blessed Holy One does not want both of them enduring together. Why don't we read uh, 197, Zev? As long as the corpse has not decomposed, the spirit cannot attain an ethereal body. Similarly, in this world, a person's good and evil impulses each seek to dominate him and to displace the opposite impulse. On the sentence, as long as this one exists, see uh, elsewhere in the Zohar. Okay, we continue. He said to him, Amar uh, I mean, I don't, there were a few words. Tava, I don't know if he said that. Okay. I'm astonished by what is written. And Satan standing at his right to accuse him. Chaya 3 1, the beginning of that same chapter. This is the case with a giant like Rabbi Yeshua, the son of Yotzadak. Then, how much more so with all the rest of, the, of us? It, it, you know we're we're in trouble. Uh, note one ninety eight. Uh, Rabbi Shimon is shocked by the reference to Sutton in this verse. If someone as virtuous as Yeshua, the high priest, is vulnerable to the Sutton, even in the afterlife, then what hope is there for normal people? Um, yeah. He replied, "A holy pious one." This is the the messenger. How hidden and concealed are these matters? He said, even though the companions comprehend matters of that world, they can't comprehend these mysteries. So his answer basically is, you just, you just be talking to him. Go on. For once a person is in that world, what benefit is there for Sutton to accuse him? Below Dailay, the the Rabbi Shemin or the, the Chavra are asking this, this messenger angel, why? Like, what is, like, the guy's dead. Why does the Satan, the Satan got his way. We, we see there's a Gemara that says the Yetzirah is, is the Satan, is the Malach Amabas, meaning that which starts to, to, to seduce you to do whatever little things and then bigger things. And then it turns into your prosecutor. And then, then it actually comes and takes you as the angel of death. Now, if they're all after, if all of these stages are ultimately after a person's death, once they got their goal, what is it? Why is it keep like attacking us? Why does the, the Satan continue to attack us in the next world about the soul after death? What does it care anymore? We can't do any more mitzvahs, we're dead. He got his goal. No, it's not over. Zohar says, on the, on the contrary, it's a very dangerous time for the Sutton because if the soul goes free, then the body just is nothing. And, and, the, and, and the body can't be nothing because if it's nothing, the Sutton is left with nothing because the, the Sutton is, is ultimately about the Yitzhahara, which is body. If there is no body, there is no Sutton. He's got no prize. I don't know if you're following that. Let's let's maybe um, finish this and then be the note. Actually, is, one is, of you have to the note is, is the son actually trying to accomplish not that essentially the the soul should not leave the body, and then he really has won. 
but if it gets no, away, he wants the soul to leave the body, but he doesn't. That's not enough at all. That's not his goal. His goal is after the soul leaves the body, to punish the soul, so that it gets that that the that in the punishment of the soul, the soul remains attached to the body just enough for the satan to have a prize. Let, let me explain it to you in, in simpler English. Let's say, for example, um, you know, you got to kill an animal before you eat it. You slaughter a cow, right? But what happens if you have no refrigerator to put the meat in? It goes bad. It's worthless. You throw it out in the garbage. So the equivalent here is it, the satan, he's not a cannibal. He doesn't need to eat your body. But there's some energy that he gets of the physical being. Now, I don't think it's the equivalent to uh, the Freudian death wish, but I want to give that as, a, as an, an analogy because most people think death is the finality of, of the physical. So like, what could be, what could the, what could there be in terms of an interest and desire for the Sutton to have an association with a corpse that the soul can't disconnect from. Say that again. What could, what could possibly be the Satan's attraction and desire to have in his possession a body that the soul is being punished in a way that doesn't allow itself, the soul, to be freed of the body. It's dead anyway, but it's not freed of the body somehow. What attraction does that have to the satan? I think it's a bigger question. If we're, what, what's the goal of the satan? And um, what is his, what's his mission statement? So, so originally his mission, and this is the, we. That's why the Zohar has a very good question, and it's, the answer is a little less clear. It's more esoteric. That's why I want to explain it better, so we so can. I, so, I, so I, let me explain the answer to, to David's question. Traditionally, we think the Satan is there to test us. Its job is to provoke us. To it's almost like. when somebody knows they can like piss you off very easily and they just like, like it, I don't know why it makes them happy. They, they just do it. Like that's their job that become, why is it their job? They take it upon themselves to be the one that provokes someone else. Right? So the Sutton knows how to provoke us. It knows how to send us into like areas that it knows how to, to, to entice us. It's an enticer and seducer and, and, and a misleader. And it gets us, it knows us and it knows how to like undermine our stability and, and our, 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 our real higher goals, our spiritual, our spiritual self. So it is in opposition. It's like, that's its job. The question then becomes, okay, it got what it's, it wanted. It, it either, it, it, you know, here the person was at Sadiq. So didn't really get what it, you wanted out of Yeshua in his lifetime. But in death, what is there? Or, or let's say a regular person who sins plenty during their lifetime. And in death, what is there left for the son? So I, I think that, that if you're going to look at it, um, like, like you were saying earlier, as a bit of a misnagad, where the mitzvah is what releases the holiness from an object and allows it to like, rejoin it rejoin its divine source and ultimately bring bring the shrina and a karash baruchu like into unity then that's exactly what the sudden is preventing in this circumstance where the soul is to the body like that spark that can't be released through a mitzvah or or in this case just through like beautiful okay transcending i love it thank you everyone especially from me to zev for a beautiful <laughs> explanation Okay, great. Did you hear what Zev, uh, somebody want to repeat what Zev said? Could you put it in different words? I had trouble. Say it again. Zev, you want to Zev say it again? I'll say it again, because I, I love it. 
I'll say l'chaim to that, l'chaim <laughs> to that, yeah, thank you. So to, to, say it, to say it in different words, um, the rabbi was talking earlier about this, this perspective that you know, we might associate with Ms. Nagden that says that um, when you do a mitzvah, when, like if you say a bracha on something you're eating, the holiness and the food then transcends the food and like returns to its divine source. But the food that's left behind is like, you know, okay, it's mundane now. You've, you've liberated the what's toilet, in it. Basically. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You've, you've liberated the good part and you don't need the husk anymore. And so what the sun would end up in the, in the garbage and in, in, in gone. Yeah. Um, but what the sun is doing by forcing the, the soul of, uh, of, of a person, especially at Sadek to stay with the body is like, it's like they're preventing you from saying a bracha before you eat so that the, that the holiness doesn't get released from the food and it's stuck there. Perfect. So you guys got it, or should I say it a third time? The holiness does not get released from the food because the um, because the bracha cannot cannot be spoken. Yeah, in other words, when you do something and and, and it had the potential to do a mitzvah with it, but you didn't. So it's basically like imagine there's I'm going to talk about the Yitzhahara as he, if he's the mafia, right? Imagine the Yitzhahara is a mafia. Every time you, you take something from the mafia, you owe him with interest, right? Mm -hmm. How do you take something and not owe the mafia? Because you basically pay for it. It's not you're not getting any favors. How do you pay for something? You give God a spark of holiness. And then in, in return, now your physical pleasure that you have is fine. It is what it is and no more. It doesn't own you anymore. It, it's it, because you're, you are, you, you, you associated with the holy. So you, you can like, you, you're not beholden to the Yitzhahara when you did that action. And therefore that action, like the physical part of it is like garbage. It's like, you, it's like throwing out something in the garbage. You ate the apple, you threw out the, 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 the core. You ate the orange, you threw out the peel. And that's it. So, but, it, but if you don't eat the apple, then if you don't make the bracha, if you don't do the mitzvah, then what you have instead is something that you can't really throw out. You can't throw it out because it has the holy thing in it, but you can't use it either because you it's going bad, it's going rotten. So it's kind of like you can't throw it out because I don't know why, whatever, you're not allowed to throw. Let's say you're not allowed to throw out the food. So what you're doing is then what's happening? The mafia is taking it. The mafia is moving in because you didn't do what you needed to do, so the mafia has control. It would be almost on a physical level where like the bacteria sets in because you didn't break it down properly to be able to compost it. You know what I mean? So spiritually, that's what you need to do. Anyway, I, I love what Zeb said. So let's go for it. But is it, isn't that sort of the car, the next point of that is that it, the, the Hasidic approach is the anti sutton approach, which means that there's th two, two distinct approaches. One is let's say the gone, which is extract and separate the two and degrade the material and elevate the spiritual. Mm -hmm. The say, the Sutton, his intention is to connect the soul to the body. And because practically now the body can't do any of the mitzvahs, the intention of that is to degrade the soul by conjoining the two and not allowing the soul to separate. The Hasidic approach is yes, they remain conjoined together but because you can continue to do spiritual things with your body, the soul is there to elevate the material versus becoming further degraded because the dominant feature is the material. And so it's like the Hasidic approach is, yeah, great. We're pre-Sutton, but because we have the mitzvos, that works. The Sutton says, no, it, I, I, this is like the perfect storm for me because if I do force the soul to be connected to the body, you're bald on both sides of your head, right? You sort of have nothing to elevate 
and the soul now gets the full degradation of being a body soul. Is that maybe? Yeah, good. Very nice. I used to work for the Sutton. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> he, he explained it to me. Okay. Okay, so let's go on. Isn't Sutton somebody in uh, New York politics? I vaguely remember that name. Sutton. Tracy uh, Mansion, I think. Percy Sutton. Yeah. Percy Sutton. He was uh, some some politician. It's a Sephardic name. Yeah, it's like Leon's. Oh yeah. yeah. Just, they just spell say, it different. They don't spell it like like the Sutton <laughs> in, in but, Hebrew. It's a different but, spelling. But just one question about this. Uh, uh, this may be a too simplified version of this, but isn't there this idea that, of course, the body will be decomposing and that the soul will still have some connection with the body for at least hypothetically, let's say, 11 to 12 months but yes. once the body is decomposed the soul is has no more attachment to the right yes and no yes but if somehow let's say it says that the, but perhaps if the person's really wicked the attachment will go on for longer mm -hmm. yeah okay okay let's continue he replied a holy pious one. <clears throat> Happy is your share. Come and see. Sutton's only interest or desire. To prevent the righteous person from putting on a garment that's pure and holy. The cave and the As soon as the Sutton sees this this garment, the Lavusha delay is Dachya. Likes. Being thrown away and considered worthless, meaning death, then he accuses him, the person, the whole person, the person, the, the soul within the body that sinned. Why? My time, I begin to eat. Because if he is clothed in that beautiful garment, instantly the filthy garment. And Satan's work, product, will be nullified and eliminated from the world. Read note 200, Sad, please. Two hundred. <clears throat> the spiritual messenger explains that when a virtuous person, person such as Joshua the high priest, dies, and his earthly body or garment is thrust away in the grave, Satan accuses him to prevent the spirit from being clothed in a pure holy garment, namely an ethereal body. Satan feels uh, attached to the flesh, which is his product as explained below, and which is eliminated once the spirit is clothed in an ethereal body. Okay. So, the, the, the bot, if the, he could not allow the soul to get its new soulful body, ethereal body, he calls it, right? We learned about that the last time. So then he'll have a, a greater hold on, on, on the old body that died. Okay. Continue. Furthermore. As long as that he's not enclosed. The spirit visits his, his dirty body, his filthy body, <inaudible> which makes Satan happy. <inaudible> as soon as he's clothed in that garment of splendor, <inaudible> the 
this body, meaning the physical corpse, is nullified and, and the associate that not just the corpse itself, but like the energy of the corpse. Is no all memory of it vanished forever. One way to understand it is is the attachment to having been physical, right? So, for example, like let's say, um, a person had an affair, let's say, and 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 they get caught and they say, okay, I'm going to end the affair. And they really end the affair. They don't see that other person. That other person may be phys- may, maybe that person even died or something, who knows, whatever. But the point is, is that in, that, in, the, in the mind, the mind is very powerful. So the association with that, that desire of, uh, that they had to the person they had the affair with isn't going away with, with the, end, the physical end of the, the affair because the um because their interest their love might have been so powerful that in their mind they're still loving that person they haven't stopped loving the person so the equivalent of that is is that the soul a weak soul that doesn't get strengthened by a, a special ethereal body is still in an affair with the Yetzahara of having lived in this world and done what it did, even if it can no longer do any of those things. It's still, its attractions and its and its experiences are still what holds on to it, which is similar to, to the idea um, in Maimonides of the, the Gan Eden being a reality that you create within the framework of this world. In other words, he understands it as a philosophical experience that the philosopher begins to detach from the physical through the power of the mind, the power of the intellect, as having abstract abilities to see things the way they are, not the way we want from our body's perspective. According to the according to the to, to Maimonides in the Guide to the Perplex, that's the beginning of recognizing another reality that's not the body, and you'll continue to live in that reality comes the Zohar and almost echoes it in its own very different and unique way saying guess what if you were just into your physical being and and, and the Yetzirah can prove that the Yetzirah now turns into your into your um, worst nightmare as a as a litigator as a as a uh, prosecutor coming after you and saying look you're this is who you are you don't deserve to get into Gan Eden, to get to that Gufzach, the ethereal body, you're just a, a, an amalgamation of desires of having lived in this world and fallen in so many ways. And if it can, if it can win its case, it, it gets you to, to be in that place still. And then that's its prize. So this is, uh, this is very Faustian, isn't it? It's been a long time since I, w- I, I watched Faust on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I don't read philosophy anymore because I'm way too old to sort of have the head to do it. But I do, I do watch on YouTube. But yeah, there was the Faust, it was the Faust skin to deal with the devil, right? Yeah. But it's almost the opposite. But it's, sim- yeah, I mean, similar in that you have to deal with the devil. Isn't this yeah. overall a concern? You, you, you sell your soul on the basis that you have a, uh, uh, all your wishes um, in the physical world, uh, um, in the physical world, granted. Ah, okay. So that's the deal with the devil. But here it is. The devil is constantly just like waiting for your failure, even after you're dead. It's just, it, it's, it's like... Uh, Knock, knocking, knocking at devil's door. Yeah, it's it's the, the cheshben gadol. It's it's the it's the accounting and it's the the legal letters that are still you know think of that. I give out. Okay, I don't. Isn't skip. this extending the very the, litfish the night czar? <laughs> yes, the more, pop, the more popular one now is the Faucian bargain. It's like it changed. Yeah, Fauci. So, hmm. yeah. Isn't this extending the? I mean, I don't quite know why, but this text is extending the influence of Satan from what used, would normally be real life to the afterlife for some reason. 
Well, it's it's look, we all know Satan is the one that is our accuser and the Yom Adin, the day of judgment after after we die. But this is why, according to the Zara, this is an additional new insight into it of what's really going on. A new a question and a, a fascinating answer. Yeah, definitely extending it and, and, and giving us a new perspective on it totally. Now you might say, um the Anan Pakten Lebe Kivre Beresh Kalelia. Oh, this sounds like it's going to start getting scary. You might say uh, that when when you visit the cemetery at the beginning of each night, this is going on. This this uh, spiritual messenger was saying, "Yeah, we we visit the cemeteries at night. So, and we've been there for a long time. Why would we do that then, right? If it's not a good thing." Well, that, that's not for the body, but rather for the nefe, the nefesh or nafsha, the soul. Lama al gufa el al nafsha, the hokal zimna de bisra kaima, rucha pakta el de nafsha. Meaning, we are a ruach. The soul moves naked as long as the flesh endures. Meaning, the, there's the soul being naked. Meaning, it doesn't have the ethereal body, as we mentioned before. Uh, and Rucha, the spirit, visits her. So we know that there's these five levels of stall. Usually we talk about Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama. Here we're going to be talking about primarily Nefesh and Ruach. Okay. Okay, the spirit visits her. And now she visits the body. So basically, the Ruach visits the Nefesh. The nefesh is the one. The nefesh is the soul that's the most physical. It's not physical, but it's the closest thing to the physiological. It's the interface between the spirit and the physiological. And so, that's the one that visits the body. And we aren't visiting the body, but we're visiting the nefesh. So it's like saying, well, we, we don't really need the body, but the nefesh needs the body, and the ruach likes to be connected to the is, is, nefesh. Is the, we, is the we here the ruach? Like who, yeah, we, yeah, the, sounds, the, yeah, the spirits that they were talking to are are ruchin, are are right. ruach, yeah. yeah, which is a you know one of like we say ruchin kadishin, you know, like holy spirits, which is a reference to these levels of disembodied souls and angels. Let's finish this thing because uh, no, I think uh, I have to read a few notes for us now. Um, um, but now the visit is the Nasha subsiding and absorbing gently within the bones. <laughs> Therefore, at the beginning of each night, a visit to Ruach to, uh, to Nasha, not to the flesh. Okay, let's read. There was, uh, is, is, this, is this a night? Is this a night activity, or is this just a day activity? But like every beginning of the night is the beginning of a day. No, it's a night activity. Uh, a night let's activity. Have, have every notes uh, one, one and two o two. Yeah. Um, as long as the spirit is not clothed in an ethereal body, it visits. No, I the think you did. You did two hundred. Um, two hundred. Yeah, I did. Okay, two o one. Um, so as long as the spirit is not clothed in an ethereal body, it visits the corpse in the grave. And 202 says, um, the spiritual messenger who is Rucha, a spirit, explains to Rabbi Shimon why spirits continue to visit their graves, even after the flesh has decomposed. Before such decomposition, Rucha visits its nafsha, the soul, which in turn visits the body, now after decomposition. Rucha continues to visit nafsha, or that aspect of nafsha that is absorbed within the bones. On Rucha visiting the grave, see above. On Nafsha remaining in the grave with the bones, see somewhere else in the Zohar. Compared to the expression of breath of bones, um, which is mentioned uh, around the Zohar and, and also, I guess, say for Hasidim. Yeah. Okay. I thought it could sound like a horror movie. Yeah, it's a little scary. Okay, we'll continue 120 in the middle. A oh, holy pious one. The structure of the human body is as follows. 
Rucha, Ruach, the spirit from the Holy Spirit, right? Because we say we're talking about the the Ruach now, and we're going to talk about the Neshama. We already talked about the Nefesh a little bit. So we're saying the word Ruach is similar to Ruach HaKodesh, right? Okay, go on. Nishmasa Migoilana Dachaye. Nishmasa, right, which comes to the word Nishima, is a breath, soul breath, from within the tree of life, right? Because if Nishama is, is Vipapaapa, Nishmas Chaim, it says God breathed into Adam's nostrils, Nishmas, the breath of life or the soul of life, breath soul. The breath soul of life, a soul breath of life, life like tree of life. Okay. As soon came in the Rucha Kadisha Yahav Chela Miyad Rasikhan delay. As soon as the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Kodesh, provides power, immediately her chariots provide theirs. Okay, we have obviously the idea of divine chariots. So this Ruach Kodesh is is then amplified by the power of the chariot. Yeah, power is bones and members, like like limbs of the body, like arms. Yeah. All from their side, arrayed one upon the other. Okay, we know 203, Zef. Thank you, Ben. Um, the spiritual messenger describes to Rabbi Shimon, the origin of the spiritual and physical components of the human being. Rucha derives from Shechina, who is known as the Holy Spirit. Uh, Nishmeta derives from Tifera, symbolized by the tree of life. The angelic chariots of Shechina generate the bones and members or limbs of the body. The phrase from their side means from the side of the chariots. The three aspects of the soul are called in Hebrew nefesh, ruach, and neshama. Um, and in Aramaic, Nafsha, Rucha, and Nishmata, respectively. Kabbalistic literature offers various and different uh, descriptions of their origin. Here, the spiritual messenger does not mention the origin of Nafsha. On Nishama issuing from Tiferes and Ruach, or from Shechina, see other places in the Zohar, and on the association of bones with heavenly chariots, also um, in the Zohar. Members uh, rendering uh, Shaifin, mm -hmm. singular Shaifa, is a frequent Zoharic neologism that may be uh, based playfully on the Talmudic description uh, al Evre uh, la, shif la shif Shifa, his arm or limb entered the casket. On the Zoharic sense of Shaifa, or the Zoharic sense of Shaifa may derive from Cholin, where it says, this joint of the thigh bone, uh, de shaf that slipped or was dislocated from place. Below, at another note, the Zohar draws on this later Talmudic line. Note the expression in Job, uh, Vishifu Atzmosav, and his bones are rubbed away. This verse is discussed below. And then see other places show up and elsewhere. Okay, great. Thank you. So we'll continue on um, page one twenty-one. Uh, Sitra Achra Yavas Bisra. The um, other sitra... side provides the the, the flesh. Um, sitra Dila Asya Bisra. Ulamila Achra. The mid side comes flesh and nothing else. Resichen di la yavin kal inun gidud ba arkin. Lam shacha damala bisra. Provide all their sinews and veins conveying blood to the flesh. Basar di ilan yave chilayu. After these provide, the heavens provide their powers. Shmaya yave chilayu. Uman inun or the ismishach al kolak yagavna del home. Skin stretch over all, corresponding to their pattern. It sounds a lot like, you know, recently there was some sort of like scientific, I'm not going to give it over in like the scientific way, but like skin or some element of skin is like the largest organ of the body. 
Yeah. In other words, it's not just a wrapping, it's like an organ. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's, it sounds a little like that here. It is. Oh, there you go. It is. Okay, good. Afterwards, Labasa Mishabran Shmaya the Arakahada, the Yave Dalin together as one. The Yave Arba Yasoda Elon. Elon. They're giving the four foundation elements of fire, go on. Esha Umaya Vavira the Afra. Go on to protect all of these coverings. Gana Al Elon, Ulachafi Al Kola. Let's read no, uh, the uh, notes of 205, 204, and 205. Yeah. Maybe he's muted. Maybe he's at Marv. Maybe he went to Marv. We need to. I'm, I am muted. I am muted. I didn't realize. No okay, so so 204 isn't that interesting. It just says on the Zohar's various and differing evaluations of flesh and the physical body, see Tishbi. Um, and, uh, and 205 says the heavens stretching over the earth provide skin stretching over the human body. The four elements, fire, water, earth, and air, protect and sustain all of these, namely all the components of the human body. On the association of skin with the heavens, see uh, another place in the Zohar. Okay, great. I'm going to uh, skip that and go to Marav just so I can say Kaddish. <laughs> 